Welcome to another edition of Bringing the Closers, Ryan Ray, alongside my good friend Ben Samuels. Ben, how's it going today, brother? Doing fantastic. I don't know about you, but uh, 2020, I mean, I'll tell you, calendar turned over and it's just been going 100 miles an hour. Great, great problem to have, but uh, super busy getting into a number of really exciting projects. I'm excited to see what uh, what happens this year. I, I know that most of us were, I think, kind of nervous coming into this year, but uh, what I've seen so far in the last three weeks has been pretty promising. What about you? Uh, I am just trying to not do anything in hopes of my check from the phase one trade deal comes in. So that's kind of me right now, hoping that I get that check in and uh, ask for 1%. So, you know, just waiting on that. Hey, man, 1%, you, you might be able to retire. You might be able to go do something else. <laughs> that's not bad. Go do nothing would be the goal. But, yeah, 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 that's that's it. That's it. So, Ben, I'll catch you off guard here because we didn't have – we have a guest coming on here in a few minutes. But before we do, um, you are into – you in kind of the, the things that you do. We talked about this a little bit last week um, about kind of how you, you have your business set up, how, how my, my business set up is a little bit different. I have more – uh, full-time employees, you use more con- contra- uh, contractors, and that's not a right or wrong. It's just this different for what we're doing. Um, but that makes you be uh, – sorry, Ben's moving his TV. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, uh, I'm surprised you can move such a large TV with one hand. Sorry. Um, that, uh, But that, that, that makes you probably get into things that I, I probably wouldn't get into. So, for instance um, – you will talk sometimes and I'll hear that you can do a, a certain task or you've done a certain task and it's, it's not necessarily the most complicated thing in the world, but it's something simple that I just never have never had to learn how to do. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious as someone who kind of employs the, we'll, we'll call it solopreneur. That's, I don't think you consider yourself that, but, but you're closer to a solopreneur than you are a, a conventional brick and mortar, right? Um, <clears throat> Walk me through, after we talked last week, maybe some of the pros and the cons of, of being the solopreneur. I know last week you said you like your lifestyle, uh, you like the, the management that you get to deploy because you don't have to be maybe as uh, you know, hands-on with everyone, things like that. So but maybe some of the, the more pros and just some of the cons because I, I've thought about that some. I go, you know, he does he does get to benefit in areas because he has to potentially – he doesn't have to, but he chooses to go and learn things that I just wouldn't go learn necessarily because – I, I would probably just hire someone to do that. So, um, but that does slow you down, increase a little drag because you got to go and pick that skill up yourself. So, um, let's let's flesh that out a little bit more. Solopreneur, some more pros and more cons. Yeah, that's a pretty open-ended question. Um, you know, there, there's a lot there. I think it's part of it's part of the journey, right? You know, I, this it, I didn't wake up one day and be like, oh, you know, I I, I can't work with anybody else, you know, in house. I, I need to, you know, I need to run the run the show. You know, it's not a it's not a power thing. It's not an ego thing. It's it's really just, um, especially in the last few years, what I've noticed, e- even on projects you know that I have partners on, and I know as soon as I say this, Ryan, you're gonna you're gonna look at me with that with this look that you're already starting. But you know, I. At, to a degree, I move too quickly a lot of times on a lot of different projects for other people to really keep up. And, and I've noticed a number of times when I have tried to put partnerships together, he's laughing offline. I, I, can, I can see it. Um, but when I try to put partnerships together, it, it, it seems not to work, not necessarily from a division of labor standpoint, but from just a capacity to do a number of different things. Um, and so I like to be malleable and, and there are a number of times, you know, and you've seen this and, and I know that you and I kind of operate differently in this, in this regard, um, or, or I feel as though we do, because I don't know if we've talked about it, but you know, there are a number of times, I mean, in, in any given year, I probably quote unquote, start a business or like, you know, get significantly down the fairway in, you know, idea generation and putting things in action you know, a couple of dozen times a year that never pan out to do anything. And I, they just, they're just projects that at some point I realize that it's not going to work and I kill it and I move on to something else. And that's kind of part of what I enjoy about the process that I, you know, that, that I employ every day because I'm able to be creative and able to, you know, okay, so I see this problem and I want to go, want to go fix it. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to call the CEO or someone else to get buy-in of, Hey, you know, I've seen this, this project you know, problem. Do you similarly see the problem? Do you want to address it? And how would we put a business together? You know, when I'm the, when I'm the only one that has to, has to be okay with the idea to put it in action, it's a lot, it's a lot quicker and a lot, uh, you know, a lot less friction. Right. Um, in addition to that, you know, when, 
So, so you and I, like, you know, we, you and I have offline had a number of conversations about starting a venture between the two of us. And, and one of the main things that we kind of get, uh, you know, hung up on is, you know, that dynamic of who's calling the shot and, and kind of who's, who's, uh, you know, end is wagging the dog or whatever. Right. Um, and so it's not necessarily, yeah. And then going, going back to what I said last week, I mean, the, the core of that outside of those, uh, those premises is, is the fact that, you know, I do value, uh, you know, the, the freedom that I have and the, uh, um, and what I do on a daily basis. And I, re I really do genuinely enjoy it. And I mean, to your point, so you don't, you know, when you have something that you need to be done, you don't have the bandwidth or even the desire to go learn a new skill if you can just, hey, plug and play somebody else in to do it, right? Now, I'm not talking about like offline, you know, passion projects that you do, but I'm talking about business stuff. You know, um, but for me, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of like the fact that I'm, I'm pretty, pretty diverse. I mean, I'm pretty competent in a number of different things, uh, whether it be building a website or cold calling or putting together a mailer campaign or any number of different technologies or softwares or um, any number of different things that I kind of have in my wheelhouse. So if I need to either, you know, if I get asked about, you know, okay, can you consult with this other group and do, you know, do X, Y, and Z, I have a pretty large, you know, wide bandwidth of, or, you know, wide repertoire of things that I can do. And so, you know, the likelihood of that is greater than, than some. Um, you know, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's, it's such a tough thing to, to really nail down. Those are just some of, kind of some of my thoughts. So let me ask you, um, no, no, I think that's helpful. Let me uh, maybe pin, pin it in here a little bit more for you um, to see if this is helpful. So running a, a you know, if you have a, a solopreneurship, uh, for, you know, where how, single single person business, however you want to describe your, your company. And again, I'm not trying to be derogatory. I don't know how you'd describe it. But um, it would seem one of the potential pitfalls might be is is two things and i say pitfalls that's not the right word but t potential things that, you, that you're watching out for so i'm curious from your perspective a does that mean that ben samuels is um maybe more inclined to take his profits and invest them in passive income solutions because there that, that you need someone working for you um so either that could be the stock market, that could be rentals, that could be land, it could be a lot of things. But you need to, you need someone working for you because you can only, we can only work so much no matter who we are. So do you feel that pressure, or I say pressure, but does that make you more aware where you go, you know what, okay, um, you know, I made X, but listen, I need to take you know a percentage of this and, and put it into something else where someone else is going to go and continue to make this money work. Um, and then the other thing would be is how does that, does that, does that create, pressure or strains on you for things like um, vacation or long-term planning where you go, you know, um, on some level, you could be a lot more flexible, but I could see potentially it could maybe create um, problems because you, you, you need someone to be there to do certain things. And if you're the main catalyst, how do you balance that? And again, this isn't a right or wrong. I'm just more wanted to flesh it out a little bit. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, so in terms of an investment strategy and kind of how I approach that, um, you know, generally, I'm and, 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 and real quick, let me just say you know, just, just before you answer, this might be helpful. One of the things you'll hear about, um, you know, a lot of business books say, well, take your profits and reinvest them into your own company. Um, and so for your company, if you're you can reinvest, obviously, some into your education, but you can't you can't reinvest to build more technology or hire more employees. So that would be the that would be the the the, the investment thing is what I'm what I'm getting at there, because it would seem like it would, it would I would imagine it works out a little bit differently for you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I grew up in this environment where I was just taught, you know, and so from a very young age, I understood the concept of multiple streams of income, passive revenue streams. That's where the real wealth is generated. And so, you know, anytime that I close a big deal and I, and I get you know, a, a nice little fee, I, I'm looking at how I can use that money and leverage, you know, either doubling down on a, on a bet that I have that's already working, or, you know, if I have a business idea that I've been waiting to just, you know, put a little bit of cash infusion in. And, and so I'm consistently looking for ways to make my money work for me, um, which in turn, you know, sometimes means that, that I'm, uh, you know, th there are times where I am a little bit illiquid, right? But I, but I like that. Uh, you know, if I'm illiquid, but I have a lot of investments that are making me money in the longer term, that's really a comfortable position for me. And, and that is born out of, and it, it's, a, it's a very me thing because I'm single with no kids, you know, I, I, kind of, I, I know my, my costs on a monthly basis are a relatively known commodity. And so I'm able to, to be extremely aggressive and a lot more aggressive 
than you know probably most financial advisors would ever advise, uh, but but a lot more aggressive than than you know my peers as well. And that's just because of you know where I am in, in life, right? Um, and so that's you know in terms of investment strategy, you know yeah I have some I have some money on the stock market and, and I and I have I do have a, a, a you know wealth manager that that manages um, some you know some trading of on the stock market, et cetera. But I mean, in terms of like Bitcoin and stuff, you know, I, um, I, I do those, you know, that kind of trading, you know, any other investment strategy that's not, you know, me wiring money into my, you know, um, uh, investment accounts is, is money that I'm putting out for, for projects that I want to see a return on. It's interesting. I mean, I was having a conversation with somebody just yesterday, uh, guys is, is independently wealthy, uh, very successful. He's out in Midland. Um, he and I were talking about a couple of ideas and uh, one of them, you know, if it works, it's one of those that it, it's a relatively new technology. But if it works, you know, we could spend maybe a million five or two million dollars on the in the beginning. But you know, the exit would be like a three to five year exit would be hundreds of millions of dollars. It's that type of idea that, or it could not, you know, could not work, and you know, we'd be out the money. And we were talking about that, and, and uh, I mentioned I was just like, hey, hey, you know, something else I'm working on, um, and we don't have to talk about it on the podcast, but I'm working on some other business that you know the way that I had this modeled. If I spend somewhere between maybe ten to twenty thousand dollars, I think that I can put together a business that will accrue somewhere between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars in revenue on a yearly basis with relatively low um, upkeep for, from me. I, you know, I need to hire I need to hire some people to make this happen. Um, but but you know when I told him that he was just like yeah, but that's small potatoes. Like why why do I want to do that? That doesn't make any sense. Who needs to be doing that when we can be doing these things over here? And my mentality, and I think it's different than most, but you know if I can do that business model four times a year the the the, the ten the ten thousand dollar yeah yeah okay. if, okay. I, if i can find like three or four or five different businesses that i can put you know ten to twenty to thirty thousand dollars in and i can you know five to ten x the money in in a relatively short order i want to rinse and repeat that as much as possible i mean yeah you know getting the idea that you put a couple million dollars into and then you sell to you know the big boy for a billion dollars is fantastic but those are the unicorns compared to what I'm talking about. And so you know, I'm, I'm just really, I think I look at those things very differently. And a lot of that comes from, and we've talked about it on the podcast a number of times, but a lot of that mentality comes from the, the people that I listen to in terms of like the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world and, and Grant Cardone and Ty Lopez. I mean, these are ideas that they're consistently talking about as well. And so for the listeners that are in, you know, involved in that world or you know, have, have gone to like a Tony Robbins conference, none of these things are new, are new concepts. Um, but I think it takes it takes a lot of fortitude and it takes a, a healthy appetite for risk that I don't think a lot of people have. Um, I, I have a, I mean, I candidly have a very jaded view on on money just in general. Um, you know, whether that comes from my you know, my history of playing poker or you know, I, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, you know, it's, and so. It, you know, it, it is what it is. And, and, you know, when I have these conversations with a lot of people, it's, it's, it seems foreign to them, which is, you know, I guess means I'm doing something right, in my opinion, because if I'm doing something different, then that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. And, and so some of those things are helpful because, you know, as someone who owns a, a, a quote unquote normal business, for lack of a better term, you know, for me, it's like, okay, do we take this, do we take the profits, do we reinvest them to the company? Do I, as a business owner, say, you know what, I'm going to diversify the comp- uh, to other businesses? And it, it gets a little bit more messy because there are people who are there and you want to take care of and make sure they have a job. And then, of course, I do have a wife and four kids, so we're on the opposite end, end of the spectrum on that. Uh, the costs are relatively the same every month, but they're, they're just, there's, a lot. there's a lot of us. And we bought a dog. Yeah. So, um, I mean, well, you've got all these mansions, so, you know, don't downplay it, but... But that, but that is that is interesting. So, at, at some point, we're at some point we're going to do like a peek behind the curtain, and we're actually going to talk about my situation. But yeah, okay, we, can, yeah. we can continue on this. Uh, yeah. Um. So, <laughs> so let's let's talk about the person right now who was maybe where you were. When was the last time you worked for someone? Was it four years ago? Three years ago? Uh, so I, I did some broker work. I was, I was a, uh, a landman for a broker. Uh, let's see. I. Fi- uh, yeah, like three years ago, end of, okay. 2017, uh, end of 2017. So walk me through the transition in your mindset. Obviously, you've got the hindsight now, but just going from, we have folks listening who are kind of where you were maybe 2016, 2017, who are thinking, okay, mm-hmm. I want to go to my own. Um, do I kind of go the route that Ryan's gone, or do I go the route Ben's gone? Not that there's a right or wrong, but what would be some of the things that you would say to 2016 Ben, hey, these things I thought are true and they're not. These things I thought were false and they're you know and they're not true and and, and, and they're wrong. And these things I thought were right and they turn out to be right. So maybe some advice for folks who are considering making that transition. 
Yeah, you know, I think the reason, um, you know, in general, the reason that I even came to Midland, the reason I got an oil and gas business was to do what I'm currently doing now. And so yeah. I had that vision of, okay, I, I want to get there and I needed to figure out how to get there. And so when I graduated, um, you know, the post BA program at, at uh, Western up in Colorado, um, you know, I, I had a job down here, but for the, uh, for the the preceding couple of semesters, I was looking around. Right. And so, you know, did I ever see myself as a company man? Absolutely not. But did I interview with most of the majors? I did, you know, and you know, the, the end result of that interview process was essentially, I got the answer of, yeah, you, you, you know, you want a position that requires two years of experience, but we're hiring somebody, you know, out of school. And so it's just like this chicken or the egg of how do, you know, how do I get in the door? And so if I had been hired by one of those firms, it, you know, my career trajectory would have been substantively different, uh, I'm sure. But, you know, I, I wasn't. So I got on with a with a broker that was doing some uh, some work with with Endeavor at the time um, with the mentality of I want to take on every single project that I'm allowed to put my hands on. I want to do every single every single thing I can possibly do. I don't want to be pigeonholed into a, into a corner. And so I made sure that the broker was was willing and able to get me into a number of different things you know, when they came up. Um, and so from day one, you know, I, I started on. So I think the first thing I did in Endeavor was I was doing cessation of production reports, which is just looking through the logs of, of uh, you know, production data and, and marrying those with you know, it has the least uh, lapsed or not, right? And, you know, and then I was working at the time that I was in Endeavor, they were doing a massive trade with XTO. And so I worked on uh, putting together some of the exhibits for the purchase and the sale agreement for that. And then I got a chance to be in some of the meetings you know, that, that, um, in the negotiations for that. And, you know, and so I continued to just see as much as I possibly could. And, and I was trying to do as many things as I could. And then I got the opportunity to go on to an acquisition project uh, that was very unique. We talked about it on the podcast, but just for people that haven't listened to previous uh, episodes, you know, I was on a project for about two and a half, three years where we, uh, we were leasing the mineral rights under the city of Midland. And so, I, you know, and I was in the acquisition capacity. I'm leasing mineral rights, you know, tracks a tenth of an acre, a quarter of an acre at times, which is so, so you know, completely different from you know leasing you know the large tracks um, out in the uh, you know, in the Permian. But also, in addition to that, you know, being inside the city, that that was a whole new wrinkle. And so that got gave me the opportunity to see a lot of new things. I know this is kind of long winded and very granular, but the the answer to your question is if you're if you're if you're trying to make your situation different and you're trying to go from where you are today to you know getting independent or, or making something for yourself, my candid advice is go to whoever you're working for now or you know if it doesn't work for, with your current employer, find someone else. Tr try to do everything you possibly can because one of the things about being, you know, we talked about it earlier, one of the things about being a solopreneur, uh, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily, I, I, I don't think I would describe myself that way, but, but let's use that word. Yeah, right, right. I'm not saying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, for, for the lack of, or for the, um, for the sake of the conversation, um, you know, if part of that is I have a lot of responsibilities in a number of different buckets. And so, mm -hmm. and so you know, while I are, I'm consistently working with other people and reaching out to others and, and trying to bolster my network with other value add, there's a substantive amount of work that I have to do myself because I can't, you can't outsource everything. Right. And, and, and so, and so if you're looking to go independent in, in this space, you, you know, you, you either need to, you know, if you have the appetite to, to partner with a couple of people that also want to do something different, but if you're really trying to do your own thing, the, I think the key is try to learn everything you possibly can. And it, and it takes a lot of work and it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because one of the things I've told people in the past is, is that, um, you know, I, I, maybe I mentioned the show or not, I don't remember if you want to, you know, if you want to get a raise, uh, or, or get a promotion rather the best, the most easiest way in my opinion is to get your boss promoted. And the best way to do that is, is do everything in your power to make your boss's job easier. Because when you do that, you start to assume some of the responsibilities that your boss has, your boss looks better. They get moved up a notch, and then the most likely person to get promoted is you because everyone realizes that you have been starting to do these jobs, and then they start coming to you. And then so, and so essentially what you're saying is if you don't get promoted, you want to go on your own, kind of deploy that model um, where you're at now, and then when you're ready to branch out, you, you, you have that um, – you have kind of the found, more of a foundation than if you say, well, I'm really good at sales. I'm going to go be the CEO of the E&P company. It's like, well – you probably need to get some technical background before you <laughs> before you go out there and take that down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so so we do have on a guest today, Ben. Uh, I guess we hadn't had a is this the first guest of the year? Um yes. Ryan. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So we have on Ryan Hunt, founder and CEO of Rig Callout. Ryan, how's it going today, sir? 
going good. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Loud Wonderful. And Loud and clear. Yes, so, so, Ryan, why don't you kind of give us a quick background of what is Rig Callout, who is Rig Callout, or however you want to describe that, who you are, and kind of uh, let our audience know of uh, what you guys do. Yeah, yeah. So we, we are a software company. We, uh, we connect the entire supply chain of the last mile of delivery in oil and gas. So any, any good or service that is being transport, transported from a stocking point to a rig site or a right-of-way or an offshore shipping point port, we can give uh, full visibility to any upstream, midstream, offshore, uh, downstream, whatever you want to call it. We can give them total visibility over that process and digitize it at the same time. So it might seem like an obvious question for you, but for folks who you know, aren't familiar with maybe this part of the business, um, what made you decide that this was the product to bring to the market at this time? <laughs> We've started the podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, good, good. I was, I was listening to the tail end of your last, um, your last call, and I was just, I was relieved that I'm not the only one that feels that stuff. Um, <laughs> so any, anyway, I'll, I'll get to it. I wasn't expecting to jump on that fast, but anywho, really my, my, my Genesis story was this, this was a major problem in, in oil field sales. So I, I spent about 10 years in, in the pipe business. So we delivered downhole tubing and casing out to drilling rigs and completion rigs. And then we delivered line pipe out to pipelines and, and gathering systems. And, and it is such a complicated process to get that stuff out to location because you're not utilizing FedEx or UPS. You are, you know, you're shipping 30 semi truck loads worth of pipe out to a remote location in the middle of nowhere with, you know, directions that are, are, are hilarious. They're, they're humorous. And so, you know, you spend such a great deal of time making sure that, you know, the trucks are getting loaded, that you actually have trucks picking up, uh, that they're getting loaded and, and an adequate amount of time and you're getting them out to location and, you know, and, and stuff happens. Stuff happens out of your control. And, and, and when stuff happens, it starts to distract you. You know, you spend an enormous amount of time just being pulled away from, you know, your job as a salesperson you know, and, and cultivating those relationships and, and focusing on where's my truck. And it always fascinated me why, you know, I can find my wife or kids anywhere on the planet in five seconds, but you can't tell me worth a mil- where a million dollars worth of pipe is traveling across the country and a truck with an iPhone in it. And so long, long story short, I, I got out of the business in 2017 Um naively thinking I could add some flexibility into my schedule by helping my wife grow her company. Uh, she is also an entrepreneur and has her own company, which is about seven years old now. Uh, she was kind of pivoting, pivoting the company to kind of focus on a different type of service or value add. And um, I was going to help her do that. And it's not an oil and gas. And after about 90 days of not being, um, around people in the oil field. I just, I missed the relationships. Guys, guys out on rigs would still call me and say, you know, hey, I need my pipe. And I'd, you know, I'd have to refer them back to the new account manager. And, um, but we'd still talk for, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes. And just, I missed the people. And I just, I said, I got to get back in the oil field. And, um, and guys still had delivery problems. You know, they would call me too by mistake, you know, hey, where are my trucks? They were supposed to be here this morning. Oh, hey, this is Ryan. I'm not your sales guy anymore. And, you know, you're, you're constantly babysitting this stuff. So the biggest, the biggest problem, you know, I always encountered in oil and gas was that last mile of delivery. It's such a small portion of a project, but it is, it is so unpredictable and variable that it takes micromanaging that process to make it successful and that's very labor intensive and so I buried myself in an office for 90 days and um, started building mock-up dashboards just on my computer I'm not a coder or a tech person by by trade 
and you know what would it look like how would it function from a pipe guy what would it do what, how would it look what information would be provided and then I printed it out, jumped in my car, drove 2,500 miles from St. Louis all around Oklahoma and Texas, went out to rig sites and old customers of mine and uh, just showed it to them and said, you know, it's what, it's what I'm thinking. You know, what do, what do you guys think? And, you know, again, while we were there, people were dealing with this problem. And, you know, and, and just to kind of go back to your question, why is the right time? The right time was 10 years ago, but nobody did it. You know, and, and, and I think right now the industry is so sensitive to cost control and supply chain right now that it is just kind of this perfect storm of, of industry dynamics, whether that's cost controls, private and public capital sources, uh, a new generation of the oil field coming in who, you know, are generally more tech savvy. They're, they're on their phone. They don't want to, for they're on their phone with through an app rather than talking on the phone. You know, young people don't want to talk on the phone. They want a text message in Slack. You know, this is the type of product and the direction that the industry is going. So it's, it's really worked out in our favor. So you brought the pipe. Um, it's interesting. I've been working on a project to bring some uh, J55 green tubes uh, across the pond, as they say, to the United States. And, and so on that, you know, we had to sit down and figure out, you know, how are we going to monitor if the ship gets sunk in the middle of the Atlantic and, you know, where the pipe goes. And then our port, our, our, uh, for us, the pipe, uh, the, the green tubes, you know, when it gets to the processing plant, we're not concerned with it anymore. It goes to someone else. Um, and so it, it feels like when, when we sat down and kind of looked at this problem from the international standpoint, you're getting it from Africa to the U.S., um, there were some systems in place, but even then there were some some pitfalls and stuff that we saw with um, how the inspection process works, who's liable for, for certain things. I, I would imagine that when you when you talk about tracking something that, um, especially like you're talking about, um, you know, line pipe or, or, or drill tubes or whatever it may be, casing, um, there's there's a lot of a lot of money at stake, and so being there on time is one thing, but also understanding where did it go, how long was it there, because um, there's folks that are liable for that um, that product along along the value chain. You you bring up a fantastic point, which is when a problem happens, it's very very expensive in oil and gas. This is not a five or a ten dollar problem, or you know a just a I don't know, like an, an upset Hilton review, you know, it's just, right. it's thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of problem that occurs. And the longer it takes you to fix it, the more expensive it gets. And we, you know, we at, at the company I came from, you, you generally, you, you're notified of the issue or the problem that has occurred. And then you, you immediately just stop and go, who messed this up? Who's at fault here? Who is responsible? You know, let me make sure I didn't screw it up. So you start searching through emails. You know, did I get the right, did I get the right well location? Did I get the right GPS coordinates? Did I get the right, you know, did the right pipe get shipped on the truck? You know, did we do what the customer asked us to do while you're on the phone with the dispatcher, while they're on the phone calling, you know, truck drivers? and trying to gather all this data to find out who's at fault. And then it's, then the, the problem kind of gets fixed in the process as you're gathering all this information. But it's really and truly like at the heart of it is how do I not have to pay this invoice? And, you know, we, we, we dealt with that too as a, as a distributor. We, we got a lion's share of our, our steel from South Korea. And, you know, you – you're limited by, you know, a fax. I mean, when you want to know where a vessel is coming, you know, through the Pacific and the Panama Canal, you get a fax update, you know, every couple of days, you know, that just gives you an estimate ETA. You know, you can go on some public websites to get a ship location, but it doesn't give you anything but kind of a, uh, a rough dot on the ocean. It doesn't give you any data to plan or to uh, predict or to analyze or, you know, really at the end of, end of the day, protect your company. So I, I, I think you hit on a very good point that I don't, I don't hear very often out there in the field when I'm talking to people. 
you know, it's generally like, well, our, our vendors will get it, get it to us, you know, and then they'll, they'll pay the bill if something happens. But how do we, how do we mitigate that altogether for everybody? Cause that drives costs down. You're going to pay, you're going to pay that anyway. Your vendor's going to cover that, that two or three or 4,000 bucks, but they're going to find a way to build that back into a cost of goods and recoup that loss at some point, you know, or they're going to spend countless man hours trying to hunt down the person that was re- responsible internally for that and recoup that. So again, you, you spin your wheels trying to collect a bunch of ghost money somewhere. And it's just, it's not a very efficient process. Yeah, that, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ryan, I'm curious. Um, so I don't know if you, how much of the conversation you were listening to, you know, when Ryan and I were talking before, before we brought you on, uh, but you know, before we brought you on, we were, we were talking about some of the uh, dynamics of, uh, you know, idea generation and, and how to put a business together and kind of, you know, what it takes to, to go from idea generation into a business. So it sounds like, I mean, that's exactly what you did. It sounds like you kind of back of a napkin, you know, had an idea, put some, put some thoughts on paper, you know, put it out in the field and then it, then it took legs. And so I'm curious if you can kind of walk us through maybe some of the entrepreneurial journey that that took, but also I'm, I'm more curious, maybe if you can give us, or I'm just as curious, I should say, um, if you can give us kind of a peek behind the curtain on, um, you know, at current, I'm sure that, you know, your, your current customers and um, your current clients are giving you consistent feedback on, you know, on how the system is working. And so I'm curious kind of how you guys have approached, uh, you know, tweaking the model and kind of figuring out what's going to be the, you know, the, the thing that, that sticks uh, the most kind of in this process because it is a new space and, and you guys are kind of figuring this out as you go along. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious what you can, what you can give us about that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always interesting to look back on, on the early days because it seems like it was yesterday, but it also seems like it was 10 years ago. Um, right. You know, when you kind of go from this, um, wow, I just left a really great paying job that I really enjoyed, um, you know, to help my wife with her company. And, you know, while this is fun and interesting, this is not really where uh, my passion lies. And, and so, you, you know, when you bury yourself in an office and you kind of, you know, develop that napkin plan, when you do I, I am the poster child for every reason that people don't start companies. It's, you know, I don't have a tech background. You know, I'm a pipe salesman running a tech company right now. You know, it, I have no or have had no investor network. You know, I don't know anything about running my own company, but really it's just, it's, it's about just doing it and, and walking one step at a time. We, we have some, some friends of ours, you know, that are just serial entrepreneurs as well. And, you know, more, more local local business entrepreneurs but we we would we would joke with them when when I had a job and my wife had an actual job and you know just like you know what what kind of school did you go get an MBA you know did you do did you do all these like these things to become an entrepreneur and they're like no you know she just said I like to do hair and I didn't want somebody telling me what to do so I just I started my own salon you know and he was a you know, a uh, real estate uh, developer, you know, and he just said, I just wanted to do this. And so they just did it. And I think that's kind of the thing that you have to understand is that you just kind of do it and you learn as you go. It's like Lewis and Clark. You just, you start on the east side of the country and you work your way west. And, you know, sometimes you run into a mountain and sometimes you run into, you know, a forest and sometimes you run into a river and you have to, you know, you have to get through that stuff. You can't just stop. And that's, that's part of the event, the adventure and the allure. I think that comes with entrepreneurship, but I think it also is what freaks people out and they kind of run away. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Actually, uh, Ryan, uh, Ray, I've I've got a question for you. So given what Ryan Hunt uh, just said, um, you know, in your business, you, you have, clients that are depending on you to, to be the, the, you know, the expert that gets it right the first time that, you know, that, that knows the process. And so you don't have the bandwidth or the ability to, to kind of like what Ryan was talking about, like figure it out as you go along and, and ha- have kind of a little bit of a capacity for error. Uh, although I'm sure there are mistakes that are made, you know, whatever. Uh, but I'm curious kind of how you, how you see what Ryan just said in the prism of, of R squared. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's interesting because, um, 
First off, we're, we are, because we, with the kind of work we do, we have to have professional licenses. So we, there's a certain degree. You can't just go do land surveying or engineering tomorrow without meeting certain criteria by the board. So if you were, um, if, 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 if Ryan Hunt, I don't know if he's a engineer surveyor, but let's assume he's not. If he, if he was, he couldn't just go do our business tomorrow because there is that distinction, which means that we have to meet certain uh, standards that we don't set that the state sets for us um, and be in compliance with those. And so I think as you kind of work through the different businesses, um, some of the barrier to entries are different than others. And that's one thing like with what he's saying here is um, well, I, that I appreciate is there is no barrier to entry as far as that I'm aware of. Maybe get the secretary of state to give you an LLC or, or whatever, but to put a GPS or to use an existing GPS to track a product and then build out a platform to kind of uh, represent that data, that's a very low barrier to entry. There's a lot of moving parts. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to diminish it, diminish it anyway. I'm just saying that, that, that it's a it is a little different than having to you know go to law school and be a lawyer or whatever. And so um, so it, it 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 does make sense that there that that you can kind of go be quote unquote entrepreneurial in those type of spaces. And I think that's why you see a lot of entrepreneurs thrive in spaces like that because they're not. They're not restricted to you've got to meet this code of ethics or you've got to meet these minimum standards and, and stuff like that. So you can kind of go out there and play within the market, whereas we really have to make sure that we meet the minimum standards every time we do a project. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm, I'm jealous. I mean, if you didn't catch that, I'm, I'm jealous of you too. So don't 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 misconstrue that. <laughs> it's I'm jealous. <laughs> like that's not me bragging. That's me like, man, must be nice just to go and play for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even importing drill pipe from South Africa, I had to deal with the feds and the South African government. So even that, like, I I don't go into the easy stuff. Now that's a deficit of my own problem. Maybe you guys should be. Maybe I should just take notes because I picked the hard ones for some reason. I, I think you, you know, you were talking when I kind of jumped, I jumped on the call a little bit early, you know, assuming we, we, we get to chit chat for a while, but you know, you, you were bringing up very good points. I think that resonate, whether you run a, you know, a, a supermarket, a tech company, an inspection company, or, you know, Oxy, you, you know, you have, it's a lot of work. You know, you, you brought it up. You have a lot of things on your plate that you have to manage. Now, if you're Oxy, you have, you know, many, many, many layers of management and support to kind of to delegate that out. Whereas as a solo, solo entrepreneur, you, you know, you are the accountant, you are the, you know, the operations manager, mm -hmm. you are the the visionary leader, you know, it doesn't matter the credentials that you have. I'm, I'm, there's always a barrier to entry. Mine was tech, you know, mm -hmm. how, okay. How do you code? You know, okay. You know, there, there are all sorts of barriers to entry no matter what you do, but, but the relative kind of consistent thing is it takes an enormous amount of work and bandwidth. Mm -hmm. I, um, my, my, my wife's company is doing a, uh, a social campaign about entrepreneurship. Her, she does a sales and marketing agency and, you know, her, her customers come to her with, you know, Hey, I'm going to do this. You know, her customers are, are people like us, you know, just entrepreneurs. It's, Hey, I need to do this, but I don't know anything about marketing. Go market it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so uh, two weeks ago, the, the week of new year. So while everybody was at home on new year's, and, you know, enjoying family time, you know, she was preparing for a, um, a trade show for one of her clients. They had no trade show booth. They had no, no plan, no nothing. I, I think they had just formed the LLC and they were <laughs> under construction in the project. So they said, okay, I have this venue. I'm doing this thing. I need to go to this trade show. Go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she had to take you know, all of the construction designs and make mock-ups. She had to go to the store. She had to basically build a booth in 24 hours. And so we, we were doing this. We, we have a family joke, you know, it's like your deadlines are my deadlines. And so, you know, if she's got a project that's last minute, I jump in and, you know, I was building furniture for her booth. And, you know, we drove to Jeff city on a Sunday morning at 6 AM um, you know, right before the kids had to go to school that Monday from their Christmas break, you know, and we spent all day in Jeff city so she could do this event for a client of hers. And, and we have pictures of, 
just our, our house in disarray because, you know, I'm putting furniture together and booth, pro- booth parts and all this stuff and then getting it packed into a van and driving out there and then hanging out with my kids. You know, that's being a parent and an entrepreneur is also different and, and unique. So, you know, we, we really bring our kids into the mix too and, and teach them about, you know, this kind of lifestyle. Because I also think that while it's hard, it's probably no more um, – there's probably no more security in what we do than if you go work for a, a big company. You know, there's they're all experiencing layoffs. I mean, Google oil field layoffs right now, and they're happening all over the place. So, so yeah, um, let me let me hop in there real quick. So, one of the things I'm curious about is you kind of have a technology that's that that, that, that you saw a market need. Um, use your background, and said, hey, this is a market need. Um, but you, you know, the old adage, especially the oil and gas, is is that everyone's slow to adopt. How has that process been talking to the old folks that you, you said that were, you, know, you had these conversations where people were just calling you because they thought you were still with the company, but then you at some point I'm sure you, you called those people back and said, hey, I'm not with those guys anymore. I'm doing my own thing, and I think I can solve a problem for us. Um, it, it seems like sometimes in the industry there's some folks who are receptive, but they're not the decision makers, and so you have to kind of wait for, uh, for that process to mature. Um, but with what you guys do, if you can save money, Make sure things are a little bit more efficient. Have you found the, uh, that, that the industry has been pretty accepting, or have you had to work on the messaging to make sure that um, um, you might have thought the messaging was this, but you found out that, no, they really want to hear this. The result's the same. It's just how you present the information. It's, it's all of the above. I mean, I, I, I also think that's a component of entrepreneurship is you kind of uh, you, you learn as you go. And you're always learning. And that's, that's the neat part of a small company, whether you're a startup or whether you're a, you know, 15 man company, it's, it's about making decisions quickly and, and moving through that. You know, I, I just working for big companies in my past, you just kind of, you get stuck, you know, it's kind of, okay, we need to control these costs. We need to cut this. Okay we're going to have a meeting next week. We'll get everybody in the room and then we'll get it into management and then we'll approve it by the board, you know, and this stuff takes, you know, this stuff can take months. I mean, that's why you see these 12, 18, 24 month sales cycles. You know, for me, we, we have, we have outside salespeople and, you know, it was, you know, boy, when I, when I get to, when I get to Dallas and I go there and I have a meeting set up right after lunch and the guy kicks the meeting back an hour, you know, when I'm sitting in the parking lot of his building and he needs to push it off because a meeting ran late or a lunch ran late, you know, it takes me forever to find, you know, companies in our, in our pipeline or within our CRM that are local. So we called Salesforce and we said, Hey, this is our problem. This is a challenge that we're having. Everybody in our database within any proximity that you're looking for. So, hey, you know, I think I can I can go cold call in a one mile radius, and Salesforce will tell us everybody in our database within a one mile radius of where the salesperson is sitting at that moment. And we had that rolled out in days. And that's just that's the neat part of of being small as you're agile. But I think for adoption. You know, even even something like that for a big company, you know, hey, salespeople, here's a cool feature, you know, getting them to adopt that is challenging, but it's got to be valuable. I think the the overarching message is it's got to be valuable to everyone or nobody adopts. That's why you see these in-house solutions failing left and right. You know, we've in some cases, we've talked to companies that have built something similar to rig call out. And they're five years into this process and they can't get adoption even internally or externally because it provides no value. It just sounded cool and they threw a bunch of money at it and they're so deep into it that they can't really turn around. And, you know, they're basically just feeding, a, um, you know, pouring water into a, a bowl with a big hole in the bottom of it. So I, I, I truly believe that messaging is a, is a little bit of it. But value is everything. You can't be, you know, you can't be the something of something all the time. You know, the 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 LinkedIn of the oil field. You know, it's why why would I go use the LinkedIn of the oil field when everybody in the oil field is on LinkedIn? You know, it just 
I think that some of the problems that you see out there now is there's so much of everything. It's right right now the big kick is to be the Uber of the oil field. There's already Uber. There's already Uber Freight, you know, and there's also like eight or nine knockoffs of Uber Freight. So right. then it becomes, well, where do I go? What do I do? And there's this confusion and, you know, and they get app fatigue. It's like, holy cow. You know, it's like, who can solve my pain? Who can make my headache go away permanently? And that's who I'm going to go with. And I think it's really just that simple. If you can come up with a, a solution to a real problem that people have and build a business around that, then, then it just takes hard work and time. Yeah, Ryan, th th those are all fantastic points. I know we're running up against the time and we want to be respectful of, of your, uh, your schedule here. So I have one last question for you before we, uh, we wrap up. Um, just kind of, you know, paint us a picture of where you, where you see uh, the, co the company moving. I mean, you know, you guys are in your relative infancy and, and it seems like you guys have a pretty good foothold. Um, you know, what's, uh, what's on the horizon for you guys? And, and I'm not asking for any, any behind the scenes, you know, proprietary or anything, but just kind of give us an idea of what we might be able to look out for in the, in the years to come. Yeah. So, so in the next couple of years, you know, we just, we want to encapsulate the, the entire last mile for the whole supply chain. And, and we do that universally. So it doesn't matter, you know, who, who does an operator use in their vendor network? It doesn't matter. You can still use our product, you know, from a, from an OFS or an equipment company, it doesn't matter. You just, you use the product and it layers it down on your supply chain. But we just look at, you know, not only kind of inbound supply chain into, you know, well sites and pipeline right of ways, but we look at outbound as well, tank to terminal. You know, you brought up a really good point, which was, you know, bringing uh, green tubes in from overseas. You know, is there value if I knew, um, you know, when my, when my tubes were put on a vessel? you know, in South Korea, you know, if I knew, you know, is there a typhoon that would delay that ship as it goes through, um, you know, the Pacific Ocean or the Panama Canal, you know, is the Panama Canal getting bottlenecked? Uh, coming into the Port of Houston, you know, is there a Gulf hurricane that could delay that? And if so, how long? What's on that ship? How long is it going to take us to get that thing offloaded and through, you know, through the free trade zone you know, get it in direct discharge. And there's a lot that goes on before that piece of pipe ends up down the hole. And you know that as well as, you know, everybody else. But I think trying to capture that whole process of, you know, manufacture to processing to rig or pipeline right of way. And then, you know, you got to get that stuff out of there too. So, you know, capturing that whole process, but then analyzing the whole thing to make the industry better. I. I really, I really have a chip on my shoulder to make this industry more efficient and more visible so that it, it, so that it thrives regardless of, you know, who gets in office or, you know, what happens in this process or do the capital markets start drying up? Well, it doesn't really matter if you're drilling in cash flow. So I think that's our, our long-term strategy is to make this industry better because it's such an amazing industry full of people that, you know, can virtually overcome any problem. I mean, the Saudis tried to kill us and we made it. We're here today. And, you know, we saw, you know, a major crisis in 2008. We're here today, you know. Um, you know, extraction is not efficient. Great. Somebody created fracking. You know, that has made that, that has essentially made us energy independent. You know, we, we have, two dollar gas at the pump because of these things you know we have cheap um athletic clothing we have cheap plastic we have all these things available to us because we're just so good at what we do and if a problem comes up you know somebody some entrepreneur is going to take a chance and figure it out and that's that's why i love this industry Okay, well, Ryan, why don't you tell everyone where they can find out more information about your company, connect with you, check out what you have going on on social media, or, or if you have an event you want to plug or promote that you might be attending here soon. Yeah, so you can find us at rigcallout.com. Uh, we have a huge LinkedIn presence. Uh, we're always on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on you know every social network that's out there. 
Uh, we're always available just like anybody in the oil field. You know, all of our numbers are online. All of our email addresses are online. You can chat with us. You can call us. You can email us. We're very accessible. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on and best of luck to you guys. I'm sure we'd love to get you on here um, in a few months to figure out how things are going and how things are progressing as the industry trucks along. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Okay, Ben, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Any key takeaways from Mr. Hunt? Yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting. I, I like the part of the conversation where we were talking about you know, how his journey kind of came organically. He addressed the need, you know, kind of put it together and, and, and went out there and, and put the business together. And like you were talking about, there's other businesses that, you know, that they take a lot of reg, you know, regulation and there's, you know, things that there's other barriers to entry that may not be born out of the idea at all. And, and so I think that's something really to, you know, for the people listening to keep, you know, to keep in mind. Um, you, you, you and I have talked about this a lot of times offline in terms of finding a business that is easily scalable, but that has very little, if, if any, barrier to entry, because those barriers to entry can be the thing that kills the idea. And I really liked uh, what, what Ryan, the other Ryan, was talking about on the pod today um, in terms of there's so many of all these different things and, and there's so much noise. And, and I kind of like the phrase that he used in terms of app, app fatigue. And I feel like I get that sometimes. I mean, there's, um, you know, I can't tell you how many of those different like scheduling and project management apps and, and websites that I've tried over the last couple of years. I mean, you know, forget trying them. I, mean, I can't tell you how much money I've wasted on a number of them that just are terrible. Um, and so uh, he's showing me a planner that like looks like it's from 1982 that I actually have to write in. That seems way too complicated. I, 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 I ain't nobody got time for that. Um, but <laughs> uh, but no, I, I like that because he's I mean, he's absolutely right. There's so many so many things out there that are so duplicated um, that it really becomes, you know, sometimes it's who has the biggest pockets, sometimes who execute, you know, it's who executes the strategy the best, but a lot of times the guy with the biggest pockets is going to buy the other guy out. And, and so it, it, it makes it complicated. So that's kind of some of my thoughts on kind of what he was talking about, but I, but I like yeah. that. Yeah. And, and one clarify on the barrier of interesting, I wasn't saying that um, one high barrier to entry is better or worse. My only point was, is me and you cannot go open a law firm tomorrow no matter how much we want to, because we're not lawyers. Um, we could go start a tech company tomorrow. That doesn't mean one's a better company or worse company. It's just, there's just, because of that, there's just fundamental differences. And so, um, so when you're, when you're thinking about opening a business, if you want to open uh, a tech firm, you can't go be a real estate agent tomorrow without a license. So it's, it's not a, it's not a one's better than the other. It's just that, that there is certain things that you literally can open up tomorrow and some things you can't. And just, um, that does because if you are governed as we are by surveying and engineering boards, there's certain things we have to be in compliance with. And I, as I said, uh, it'd much rather be able to kind of do to run. But, run, don't, run, you, but don't you sit on all those boards? Don't all those people answer to you? I mean, <laughs> ah, boy, you're going to get me. Yeah. We had to cut that. But the, oh, good Lord. I'm done now. They're going to pull off our licenses. We love the boards. We love all the boards. We appreciate all the boards. The boards are great. They're magnificent. They're the best boards ever. Boards around the world look to our boards and go, why can't we have boards like that? Um, so as, as someone who not, loves am boards. Am not helping? You're not helping. Not no, helping. I love the boards. I love the boards. So anyway, so, so I want to be clear. I wasn't being derogatory about uh, or saying that what we do is better what you guys do. So I'm just saying it's just, again, we, me and you cannot open a law firm. That's not because not we have capital restraints. That's because the lawyers made the law that it prevents us from legally opening a law firm. <laughs> You're right. Can you, and so, can, can you imagine if the two of us opened the law firm together? Dude, we'd win every case. We would dominate. Let me tell you something. I, I I beg for the day. I beg for the day that I get to represent someone in court. I will destroy. I will have so many emotions and arguments. <laughs> they will take me out in handcuffs because I will be going on about something and probably get myself thrown in jail. So, yes, I look I'm forward having, to I'm having, I'm having flashbacks of my cousin Vinny. <laughs> so Ben uh, I know we're a few weeks out from Nape you will be down there are you going to Nape this year I can't remember <laughs> <laughs> sorry 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 inside joke tell Oops. people remind people Oops. when you'll be down in Houston for Nape I'm actually going to be in Houston for the first two weeks of February I'll be at Nape then I'll, um, the next week is the uh, Reduce Water Society conference would love to meet uh, we'll see people that are going to be down at, the, um, at Nape and then uh, the week after the Produce Water Society Conference, there's the Permian Basin Water and Energy Conference here in Midland. It's all be at that as well. And so I'm going to be 
jumping around a bunch, but uh, should be for, for a man who came on this podcast and railed against conferences, he sure is going to a lot of conferences. So just, I look forward to the post-conference, conference, conference recap session that we get to have where you complain about the deficiencies in only guest conferences. So I am looking forward to that. Listeners, I hope you are too, and we will talk to you next week.